My message is, and I talked about it in Sunday school, my message title, believe it or not, is you've got to be kidding. You've got to be kidding. Here we go again. Let's read the verses and you'll see what I'm talking about. In Numbers 21, starting with verse 1, the king of Arad, the Canaanite, who dwelled in the south, heard that Israel was coming on the road to Rathrim. Then he fought against Israel and took some of them prisoners. So Israel made a vow to the Lord and said, If you will indeed deliver this people into my hand, then I will utterly destroy their cities. And the Lord listened to the voice of Israel and delivered up the Canaanites. And they utterly destroyed them and their cities, so the name of that place was called Hamah. Then they journeyed from Mount Or by the way of the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom. And the soul of the people became very discouraged on the way. And the people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water. And our soul loathes, and this is the important part, this worthless bread. Boy, that's something right there. So the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people. And they bit the people, and many of the people of Israel died. Therefore the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people. Then the Lord said to Moses, Make a fiery serpent and set it on a pole. And it shall be that everyone who is bitten, when he looks at it, shall live. So Moses made a bronze serpent and put it on a pole. And so it was, if a serpent had bitten anyone, when he looked at the bronze serpent, he lived. Lord, be with this message. <clears throat> I know what you're thinking. What a strange title for a sermon. What could the pastor have been thinking of when he came up with that one? And yet, but when we read these scriptures and find once again, and by the way, this is the eighth time that Israel complained against God over this, that, or any other thing, we find out that when we read these scriptures that Israel started down the complaining road again. So soon after God had just led him to a great victory. That's why the title of the sermon seemed to fit in this case. Let's look and hopefully learn a valuable lesson from Israel's heir. That's why I named it, you got to be kidding. Here we go again. Moses, by this time, he had already was so mad in Numbers 20, uh, chapter 20, verse 11, that he struck the rock when God told him to speak to the rock. And because he did that, he disobeyed God, he was never allowed to go into the promised land and lead his people. And yet here the people, once again, to the point where he said, we loathe this worthless bread. Remember, in John 6.35, Jesus said, what is it? I am the what? The bread of life. We saw it in Exodus 16, we saw it in Numbers 17, we, on and on I can go, and yet the Israelites were complaining once again. But before we jump, before we point a finger, before we judge, let's examine our lives. How many of you, if you were to measure you, were you are you minor complainers, moderate complainers, or major Complain. You don't have to raise your hand. <laughs> Dave's got a problem with his arm this morning, so I don't know what it is. Anyway, how would you rate yourself? How often do we forget God's blessings? How often do we complain instead of praising God? How often do we complain instead of honoring God? How many of us complain before praying to God? How many of us complain before studying about God? This message is not only about them, it's to you and I 
because I am just as guilty of this as anybody else. We're always ready to complain when things get tough. I call us the wah, wah, wah Christians. Always whining instead of thanking God for what we have. Number one, let's look at the Bible. See how important it is to avoid, and by the way, this is sin of the most grievous type. Because complaining shows a lack of faith in God. Amen? Number one, an example to follow or not to follow. In Romans 15, 4, for whatever things were written before were written for our learning, that we through the patience and comfort of the Scriptures might have hope. Number one, you're not going to have hope if you're constantly complaining to God. You're not going to go, whoa, I don't have a new car. <coughs> or I don't make enough money. Or I can't have my hobbies or my toys or whatever it is. Instead of thanking God that we got breath in our lungs. Instead of thanking God that we can come to God, pray to God, ask God, search our hearts. You know, we're always quick to say, well, this guy has more than I do. Instead of being content, as Paul said, for what we have. And many of us are guilty of that as we go through our Christian growth. I was bad at it. I was notorious at it in my young Christian age. But I finally woke up and realized I better start praising God. Or he, might, he might take what I already have. Amen? You know, when you start thinking and complaining to God, God may just remove some stuff to really give you something to complain about. Amen? That's called chastisement. In 1 Corinthians 10, 6, Now these things became our examples, what we just read, to the intent that we should not lust after evil things, as they also lusted. Many times we want things that we don't need, just what we want. Well, I want a lot of things, but I learned I can't have it. I still wait by the mailbox for my stimulus package. But I've accepted it ain't coming. But praise God, I have been totally blessed with what He has given me. And the greatest gift is called salvation. Amen? Amen? I have a roof over my head. I have food on the table. I have clothes on my back. Praise God for that alone. Many Christians don't even have that. I believe America is the spoilest, richest nation on earth. We have so much, and we think we have so little. We got a lot of lessons to learn. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 10, 11, Now all these things happened to them as examples, and they were written for our admonition, upon whom the ends of the ages have come. We better learn. You know, one thing I learned as a kid, most of the time I had to learn the hard way. I had a rebellious streak that went from here to Hoboken. And I was paid for it. I couldn't learn the easy way. I couldn't submit. I couldn't accept what blessings I had. Till many times, the Lord took it from me. Now don't get scared. This is not a message on tithing. But I used to be bad on tithing. I'd always say, I don't have the money, Lord. I'm short this week. Well, the Lord made sure I was shorter the following week. Amen. And he stressed on me tithing. It wasn't about the money. It was about the heart. And every time I decided to hold back or steal from God, I paid triple fold. Oh, the bills that I weren't expecting just flowed in. And yet when I trusted God and started tithing, all of a sudden, I had things pop up out of nowhere. But it goes beyond the tithing issue. It goes about all aspects of our Christian life. Amen? Number one, a promise, a vow made in the flesh. These Israelites, you saw, they said, Oh God, we promise to follow you if you just kill these Canaanites. 
Number one, they made a promise in the flesh they can't keep. Amen? They said, I will, instead of saying, God, allow me to. Let's go back and look at it. Right here, he said right at the very beginning. So Israel made a vow, verse 2, to the Lord. If you will indeed deliver this people into my hand, then I will utterly destroy their cities. And they were supposed to be happy ever after. They made a vow which they weren't going to commit to. Brothers and sisters, don't make a promise to God unless you plan on keeping it. Amen? Don't make a promise to God, period, if it's in the flesh. I made a promise to God that I'm preaching His Word faithfully, and I'm serving Him faithfully, and I better keep that promise. Because that is serious business. Amen? And we've got to understand that. Thy shall not use the Lord's name in vain. goes way beyond cussing. That meant don't use the Lord. Don't say, Lord, I promised that you're going to do this. Or, Lord, outside of your Bible, I know you're going to do that. That is called using the Lord's name in vain. We're commanded not to do it. But never in the flesh. In Joshua 24, verse 15 and 16, listen carefully. And if it seems evil to you to serve the Lord, choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve. This is Joshua speaking. Rather the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the river are the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And so the people answered and said, Far be it from us that we should forsake the Lord to serve other gods. And then came the book of Judges. <laughs> the book of failures. Promise after promise after promise after promise after promise. They followed him for a while, but they never went to distance. They made a promise they couldn't keep. And so God threw them right back into captivity again, time and time again, not just once, but several times. You think they'd get the message. Well, Christians, sometimes we don't get the message. Amen? Because God said, pick up the cross and what? Follow me. Go the distance. You'll find that in Mark 8, 34 through 38. We need to understand that when we make a promise to God and we do it in the flesh, we are going to lose. Say, if God allows. That's what we should be saying. Now, I know if I were to say, how many of you love Jesus Christ? You'd all raise your hands. But how many of you love him? To go the distance. Amen. See, this is the things we need to think about as Christians. When we start using our mouth without our heart. Listen to Joshua 24, 21 and 22. And the people said to Joshua, no, but we will serve the Lord. So Joshua said to the people, you are witnesses against yourselves that you have chosen the Lord for yourselves to serve him. And they said, we are witnesses. Boy, did they blow that one. Amen. Brothers and sisters, if you say you're going to serve the Lord, prove it. When you say you're going to serve the Lord, act it. When you say you're going to serve the Lord, be ready to go the distance. When you say you're going to serve the Lord, say it with love in your heart, not commandment in the mind. Because God wants us to serve him out of love. Amen? Amen? I know I'm hitting sensitive nerves here. And that's good. That's what churches are preaching should be all about. In Luke 22, 33 and 34, But he said to him, and this is Peter, How many of you remember that guy denied Jesus three times? And so Peter responded back to Jesus and said to him, Lord, I am ready to go with you, both to prison and to death. Then he said, Jesus said, I tell you, Peter, the rooster will not crow this day before you have denied me three times that you know me. In the flesh he said, ah, I'll be with you if even all the rest abandon you. 
but he was doing it in the flesh. But when fear of death or imprisonment came on him, he buckled. Why? Because he made a, a promise by the flesh and not by the spirit. Amen. I don't depend on my strength. I depend on God's. You're gonna, I did a sermon on that just a week or so ago. But it's so important to understand this is what Israel's problems were. They were making promises they could not keep. They were constantly complaining. They forgot they had been taken out of Egypt, taken out of bondage, set free, and already complaining. In fact, they got so bad, a couple times they said, let's go back to Egypt. Let's go back in the bondage. Egypt always represented the old world, the sinful world, the deliverance, the promise was delivered out of the old world into the new. How about you? Are you new Christians? Are you real Christians? Are you praising Christians or complaining Christians? I've met all kinds. Praising Christians always praise Lord. Yes, they have crisis. Yes, they have problems. Yes, they have tribulation. But they give it to the Lord. Then you got the complaining ones. Oh, I love that crowd. And every church has them, the complaining ones. I've been, I've been in some churches. Boy, carpet's blue. I think it should be pink. The shades, they should, the flowers, they're not arranged. That flower should be down there. That flower should be up there. Now, if you think I'm exaggerating, I'm going to tell you a quick story. Dead serious. Back at my church in Fernley, I got up to preach. Just moved to Nevada a year or so ago, and he got up to preach, and he happened to say, get up during a sermon. There's no exaggeration. And he said, it's good to be here in Nevada. And this lady got all indignant in the church. I suppose it Christian, and got mad and said, he said, Nevada, instead of Nevada. Now, thank God he didn't say it to me. She, I would have said, so what? She left the church. Yeah, never came back. Salvation depends on Nevada and Nevada? The pastor said, yeah, I guess we offended her, and she left. And I said, let her go. Complaining Christians. Now, what a stu <laughs> stupid thing to complain about. Amen? Yes, Nevada. You're going to hell in a handbasket if you say Nevada. You people say Nevada? I'm picking on this side now. But you said Nevada. That's your entrance into the pearly gates. Complaining Christians. Now, that's one of stupid ones, but there's so many more. And yet the Israelites were forgetting where they came from and definitely forgetting where they were going. From bondage to freedom. And so they called it worthless bread. That did it. That was the tipping point for God. How soon we forget. Verse 4 made it clear. Verse 4 when they journeyed from Mount Or by the way of the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom, and the soul of the people became very discouraged on the way they had forgot. This is the same God that brought manna from heaven, who gave them quail to eat. In Numbers 11, on I could go, give them everything, led the way, give them water to drink. God himself did it, and they still, how easy we Forget What a tragedy. Never, never, never forget the blessings you have today. Never forget what Jesus did for you on the cross today. Because the day you forget is the day we start complaining. Let's go on. Psalms 50 verse 22. Now consider this, you who forget God lest I tear you in pieces, and there is none, be none to deliver. In Psalm 78, 11, and they forgot his works and his wonders, which he had shown them. 
In Psalms 106, 13, they soon forgot his works. They did not wait for his counsel. They were on great times. You know, it's, you know what the easiest time to be a Christian is when everything's just flowing right along. No health problems, no financial problems, no problem problems, nothing. But the first time we hit rub waters, oh, the whining begins. And we're all guilty of it. Amen? Oh, boy, I am hitting nerves today. See, we forget. Jan, boy, she says, you got amen. Now, we're all guilty of it. I'm guilty of it. You're guilty of it. Many times. But we need to remember, Jesus will take care of you. Do you believe that promise or not? Remember that one in Matthew chapter 6? Do not worry about the clothes you shall wear, the food you, or clothes. God knows that you have need of these. Now, either we trust God or we don't. But we trust Him all the time, not 50% of the time. That's what Israelites did. We forgot the blessings, and then the complaining begins. In verse 5, I already read it. Listen to Exodus 16, verse 12 through 14. I, God once said, I have heard the complaints of the children of Israel. Speak to them, saying, At twilight you shall eat meat, and, the, and in the morning you shall be filled with bread, and you shall know that I am the Lord your God. And so it was that quails came up at evening and covered the camp, and in the morning the dew lay all around the camp, and when the layer of dew lifted, there on the surface of the wilderness was a small round substance as fine as frost on the ground. That was the manna. Praise the Lord. Now, if you don't think God has a sense of humor, read Numbers, I believe it's 1120. I love that verse. I enjoyed it so much. Remind me of when I was a little kid. Read that verse sometimes. He said, you want meat? I'm going to give it. The verse actually said, I'm going to give it till it's flowing out of your nostrils. And they ate it 30 days, and they got sick and tired of quail. How many of you eat the same thing every day, and you get tired of it? Well, that's what God said. Okay, you don't, I'm going to give it to you and ram it right through your snouts until it comes out of your nostrils. Don't tell me the Lord hasn't got a sense of you. Praise the Lord. Instead of praising God, we have me. Praising God, we have bread. We complain, amen. How many of you had that problem? We eat the same thing day in, day out, day out. Nobody? Am I talking to a bunch of statues here? I want you to go home, eat the same thing for 30 days, and come back and tell me you love it. I knew that. Why did I not know that was coming up? I can't win. Yesterday I took Juan and the kids to dinner. Juan's sitting right by me, and there's broccoli, and he goes, look, Pastor. Shoving broccoli down my throat and smiling. First time I wanted to kill a Mexican. But I knew that would come up. Silly of me to think otherwise. Philippians 4.11. Not that I speak in regard to need. Listen to this and memorize it, please. For I have learned in whatever state I am, to be content. Did you get that? It's not easy to do. Sometimes it's hard. But when we complain, God's judgment is inv inevitable. Let me tell you something. I have learned. Here's how I learn. I have a place I go to. It sounds silly to you, probably. Every once in a while, I get my, oh, poor... Pastor Rick, I got it so rough. Wah, wah, wah. And I go to a place every time, and boy, it shocks me to no end. You ever been up to Virginia City to the cemetery? Oh, I go through there, and I average age is 30. If you live to 40 or something. And so many of those graves... Several of them had three children dying at the, all before they reached the age of four. One was the record. I went all the way back, almost weeped. Six kids died in one family before they reached the age of 12. I can only imagine what that family went through. 
If you start feeling sorry for yourself, go to the Bible. If you want to see it in real life, go through that cemetery, and trust me, you will never whine again. They had an epidemic up there of some fever that took children by the bushels with, between 1865 and 1885 which you had some fever go through and killed bushels. And pe- people worked, and they died 24, 34, 25. I went home. Kid, don't complain. So when I start feeling sorry for myself, I get my exercise, I go up there, or I read about the Great Depression. Or there's a series on Netflix called The Dust Bowl. You don't want to watch it. You'll cry like a baby. Now, are you thankful for what you got? A lot of silence here. I'm glad to hear that. Because praise God, we may think we got it, but look around. Somebody else has it a lot worse. God's judgment on complainers will come. Verse 6. Look at it again. Very clear here. So the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, and many of the people of Israel died. Why? Because they complained. They forgot the blessings. They were so hung up on the complaining. God says, okay, I'm going to teach you a lesson. And I'm really going to give you And what did they do? Oh, God, God, save us from the fiery serpents. They didn't have to have them to begin with if they just would have honored and blessed God for what they have. Hosea 11.7, My people are bent on backsliding from me. Though they call to the Most High, none at all exalt him. Exalt him. Why? Because they were so busy complaining, they didn't want to remember that God has given you life. God has given you salvation. God has given you everything you have today. Everything you have today, beware, except for salvation, he can take away. Amen? Be cautious. 1 Corinthians 11, 30 and 32. For many reason, for this reason many are weak and sick among you and many sleep. You know what that sleep meant in Christian word. They died. For if we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened by the Lord that we may not be condemned with the world. God will chasten us. He will take us to our knees if we forget the blessings that God has given us. Amen. A warning from God. 1 Peter 4.17 For the time has come for judgment to begin at the house of God. And if it begins with us first, What will be the end of those who do not obey the gospel of God? I thank God I'm saved. That blessing alone, I say, hallelujah, Jesus Christ. I like the way Alice DeVoe does it. Hallelujah. Raise those hands. Amen? Amen? And thank God for the salvation. And that's one thing he will not take away. God help us. Here we go again. Verse 7. They were complaining. And they said, we have sinned. Now they're confessing for the umpteenth time. We blow it, Lord. 91, Psalms 91.15 He shall call upon me and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. In Psalms 18.6 In my distress I called upon the Lord and cried out to my God. He heard my voice from his temple and my cry came before him even to his ears. I thank God for what I have. How about you? Psalms 50, 15. Call upon me in the day of trouble. I will deliver you and you shall glorify me. But here's the problem, folks. Many times we get ourselves in trouble. And it's always God that has to pull us out. Amen? Think what would happen if we never got in trouble in the first place. You know, I wonder if God, you know, at times, I know he doesn't. He's always there to answer. I wonder if God sometimes, boy, here we go again with this guy. Look at Rick South. He's complaining again. And now i got to forgive him how many times? He keeps forgetting the blessings and he keeps complaining. And yet our Lord is a loving God and he still forgives. I wonder if I, I think the first words God's going to say to me when I get up there is, you knucklehead. Look at how many times 
I, what I did for you. I speak for myself. God to the rescue again. Verse 8 and 9. In Exodus 14, verses 13 and 14, And Moses said to the people, Do not be afraid. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, which He will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians who you see today, you shall see again no more forever. That's talking about the parting of the Red Sea. And then He sent the Red Sea and drowned all the Egyptians. Because once again, they saw all the hordes coming. They were afraid. Instead of trusting God, they trust in what they saw, not what they believed. Not what they believed. Isaiah 12, 2. Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid. For Yahweh, the Lord, is my strength and song. He also has become my salvation. When you see yourself surrounded by armies and you have fear, give it to God. He is always there. He was always there for the Israelites. They were just too blind to see it. Hosea 1.7, Yet I will have mercy on the house of Judah. I will save them by the Lord their God and will not save them by bow, nor by sword or battle, by horses or horsemen. He's going to do it by God's power. How do you think you and I stay saved? Amen? How many of you believe, I know none of you would raise your hand, say you earned salvation. How many of you believe you still earn it by keeping it? Who do you think keeps you saved? God does. Jesus. Amen? He not only saves you, He keeps you. Praise God for that. In conclusion, amazing, isn't it? God brought them out of the land of Egypt. He parted the Red Sea. They had forgotten the manna from heaven to the point they called it worthless. They had forgotten the water out of the rock in Exodus 17. We learn the sources of Israel's complaining. Number one, their spirits were not faithful to God. Number two, they refused to obey God's law. Number three, they forgot the miracles God had done for them. You see, our complaining often has its roots in one of these thoughtless accusations, actions, and attitudes. If we recognize this as sin, then we can avoid the mistakes of Israel. Amen? Through my Christian life, I did, oh, I wanted this. I had to have the new car. I had to have the new stereo. I had to have the new house. Of course, in the military seven years, I didn't have nothing, none of that. <coughs> but the Lord took care of me. Here I am. Do I look thin? Do I look like I'm lacking any Whopper burgers? Not one crack about broccoli. So anyway, what do we know about the Israelites? If there's one thing to learn, it's this. Rejoice, Philippians says, for, for, and always rejoice for what you have. And don't think for a second, and there's plenty of verses in the Bible, he won't take it away. If you're dependent on your bank account, you're going to lose. If you're depending on your house, your car, or all your possessions, every funeral I've been to, there's only one thing in that coffin. That's the body. The Lord giveth, and the Lord will take it away. But in the great, the greatest thing he will never take away is your salvation. In closing, Deuteronomy 8.11, Beware that you do not forget the Lord your God by not keeping his commandments, his judgments, and his statutes which I command you today. Amen? Hard lesson, isn't it? One of those warm and funny, fuzzy messages. But let me tell you something. I learned the hard way many times when I complained. And most of the time it was stupid stuff, trivial stuff. It wasn't stuff I needed. It was stuff I wanted. And God always brought me to my knees. And boy, they were hard lessons to learn. 
He will always take care of you, but you've got to trust in Him. That's, let's stand. At the end of each service, I encourage anybody who is not absolutely sure that they're going to heaven. How would you like to make sure without a shadow of a doubt that if you were to pass from this world into the next, would you be with Jesus in heaven? I encourage those who would like to bow their heads right now and ask Jesus Christ as personal Lord and Savior. That's all God asks you to do, to trust Him by faith and accept Him by His marvelous grace and ask Him into your heart and you can be saved today. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you.